Greetings all, Dr. X here. Good to see you again. All right, so this is part two of a two video series all about tips for early career faculty members that are on a tenure track. So if you haven't watched video one yet, I'm gonna encourage you to go back. I'm gonna go ahead and leave a link up there for you to um, click and go back to watch video number one. If you've already watched video number one, let's go ahead and get ready for uh, the tips in video two. Let's get started. Okay, tip number four. Teaching is secondary to research and scholarly activity. Okay, I'm going to say this again. Teaching is secondary to research. Teaching is secondary to scholarly activities. Now, I know that's going to be hard to hear. You know, I was uh, in the College of Ed, and it was hard for me to understand that. <laughs> but the reason that you were hired at your institution really was as a researcher, at least most of the people watching this video. You are hired as a researcher and the institution expects you to take your research and publish your research so that it pushes the university's name out there. It pushes out your research and it shows how great the institution is for hiring you because of your expertise. So teaching becomes secondary to what you do in research. Now, here is the tips that I have for you about thinking about that Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. The first thing you need to ask for is a course release. Like, you need course releases at least for the first two years. If you're at a Research One institution, even if you're at a Research Two institution and research and scholarly activity publishing is part of the requirement for your tenure and promotion, you're going to need some course releases. So you should be going and asking, if you didn't negotiate this before you came in, now you need to go to your department head and say, listen, department chair, department head, and say, listen, I'm going to need to get down to at least a 1-1 one -one teaching load. If they won't go for that, then ask them for a 2-1. That means two in the fall, one in the spring. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, because course demands that on your work, you, it's just the demand on your time and the workload that's significant. And it's significant because you're new at the institution. These are all brand new course preps for you. And if you have multiple preps in a semester, it takes time away from what you need to be spending your time on, which is peer review journal articles. Okay. So you're going to go and you're going to ask them, is there any way you can have course releases, especially for the first two or three years, so that you can focus all of your attention on publications? Now, if you do get those, you need to be putting out some publications. You don't need to be going for a movie in the afternoon. You need to get a writing time, schedule writing blocks of time, get some peer-reviewed journal articles out. Focus on that. Um, instead of four or five courses a semester that you're trying to teach. Now, the pro tip that I'm going to give you for this tip number four. Here's the pro thing you want to do. You want to use your teaching as an opportunity to produce at least one of the journal articles you'll have published by the time you go up. And if you're seeing a statistical improvement in the evaluations that you get from your students, that in and of itself can be a journal article because you have some statistics to support the improvements you've been doing in your teaching. See? See how that works? All right. So that's tip number four. On to tip five. Okay. Tip number five is this. Service will not get you tenure. I know that people don't want to hear that because you're a new faculty member, you're fresh blood coming into the institution, and everybody and their mother is going to be coming and trying to get you on a committee. Let me just say right now, don't do it. <laughs> Tenure does not come from doing all the service obligations at most institutions. Now, there are some where you can just do service, service. If you're at a Research two institution, an R2 you know, service counts more and weighs more on your evaluations. But if you're at an R1, service is not going to get you tenure. 
but they will ask you and they will want you to serve on every committee known to human beings. What I'm telling you is if you want tenure, that is not where most of your time needs to be spent. So I'm going to look at my notes. I'm going to give you a couple of recommendations about what kind of service you need to do. Because you do have to do service in order to get tenure, but you want to be smart about the service that you take on. All right. So choose service opportunities that will take you the least amount of time, but that they still count. So there are some committees you can serve on at the department level that only meet once a semester for two hours. That's a good committee to get on. Maybe there's a university-wide committee that you can sit on that meets uh, once or twice a semester for one hour each time. Okay, that is a really good committee for you to consider as a tenure-track faculty member. It shows that you're doing service, but it's not taking away from your uh, the time that you need in order to publish. Now, limit your service opportunities by learning how to say no gracefully. And your mentor should be able to say no on your behalf from time to time. Sometimes that'll make a huge difference for you as you're going through tenure promotion, all right? All right, here's my pro tip for this one. Tie all of your service back to your research agenda. And if possible, have one of your journal articles be about one or more of your service opportunities. Again, you're tying everything back to your research agenda. And even service can be used as an opportunity to publish. All right? All right. So now that I've covered research, teaching, and service, I promised you that I would earlier in video number one, in part number one, I told you I'd give you a more um, realistic allocation of effort where I think your percentages should be, and here it is. For research, it should be 60%. Teaching should count for 30% and service should be 10%. Now I'll say it again, research 60, teaching 30, service 10. That is a more realistic expectation of what you'll need to produce as a first through third year um, early career faculty member that's on a tenure track at the university. I think if you spend, the again, the majority of your time, twice as much time, on research as you do on teaching um, and significantly more time than you do on service. Uh, if you and your mentor can work that out, you'll have a better chance of having what you need uh, in your dossier by the time you go up for tenure and promotion. All right, two more tips to go. Tip number six is you need to build a support network. And I have specific people I think that you need to have in your support network. But your support network really is people, um, colleagues, and mentors that can help you when you have questions and as you're going through the tenure and promotion process. Now, here are the people I think that you should definitely for sure have as part of your support network. It's your support network. You make it up of all the people that you think are, uh, you need in it. But really, these are the people I think that will make a difference for you. One, you should have a department mentor. There should be somebody uh, that's assigned to you or someone you identify. Um, you, you like their research. You've seen uh, what they've done as a mentor for other people in your department after you know, you have, you've observed their work. You can connect with them. Um, you choose a department mentor or you'll have one assigned to you. Either way, you should have somebody from your department as a mentor. Um, you need to have a confidential colleague outside of your department, but still at your institution. Again, it should be someone who is a colleague of yours that you can share about what your experiences are in your department. You can check in with them maybe about what's going on in their area for tenure and promotion, but it needs to be somebody you can trust it to be confidential about what you share with them. This is not somebody you're going to pick, just randomly pick on the first day when you get there. <laughs> Instead, this is someone you'll start building a partnership with during that first and second semester to where you feel confident with them sharing with you and you sharing with them. 
a, a confidential colleague at the institution. Have a network of people outside of your institution you can call and check in with as you're going through. And then this is going to be controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. I actually encourage the people I'm coaching to have a lawyer they can check in with if they ever need to. You know, the whole time I was on the tenure track, I kept a lawyer on retainer um, because if you submit some documents that you were told you need to submit and then that counts against you later. If there are any problems along the way, having an attorney on your side can really make a difference with you understanding the grievance process, the um, EEO process. If you ever, ever need to challenge a decision that was made for you, having that legal backup can make a huge difference. Now, when I was on a tenure track, my the lawyer I kept on retainer was a full he was a full he is a full professor at a university in the law school. Now I'm not saying you have to go to that level, but you want to you want to feel comfortable asking questions of someone. Um, and keeping an attorney on retainer can help with that. All right? I know I'm going to get comments on that one. All right, so that's tip number six. Final tip here is seek feedback. This one is really quick. You'll get feedback from your students on the student evaluations. Um, I would ask for feedback from my mentor every semester. Just sit down with them and get feedback each semester. Uh, you'll get feedback from your colleagues, and as you're submitting to your senior faculty, you'll get feedback from them. Read the feedback. Take what you can. That'll make a difference for you moving forward. Okay, that is it for everything I have for you on this two-video series about promotion and tenure. Now, if you have any questions about anything that I said or any of the tips I made, go ahead and put those in the comments below. I'll do my best to get back to you pretty quickly with a response, or I may uh, make another video in the future. All right, so I know this was a lot to process. But hopefully it makes a difference for you as you're going through your promotion and tenure at your institution. Congratulations on your new position and all the best of you as you journey forward. Now, don't forget, I have a free handout of all seven of the um, tips that I've made for you. Just a one page handout. Uh, that you can keep with you, and it has my contact information on it should you have any other questions, all right? If you'd like a copy of it, look for the link in the description below. Um, go on over, click the link, submit your information, and I'll email you a copy of the one-pager that has all seven tips on it. Hey, thanks so much for watching today's video. I really appreciate your engaging with the content here on this channel. If you'd like, go ahead and click the thumbs up and leave me a comment below. I always love engaging with other people in higher education. Thanks so much for watching and have a terrific day.